And this is where our story begins. Today, all over the world, people are commemorating the actual resurrection of Jesus. But for you and for me, we're at a place where we understand that there's a world out there that we never thought that we'd be there. That there are things that we face that we never thought were possible. The opinions, the media, the propagandas of life, the differences of feelings, all of those bring us down to one thing. You see, God did everything that He could and did everything that He would. He took responsibility for His created ones. He sent Jesus to the earth to buy humanity back, and that includes each and every one of us. He bought us back from slavery. He bought us back from the things that have put chains around us, around our minds, around our actions, and around our lives. If you have not come to that place where you can actually, with all honesty, say, and all honesty say that you have fallen into the grip of something that you never planned that you never wanted but it was something that grabbed you and you began to justify it. You began to have less and less feelings of something taking you in a direction that you did not want to go. But Resurrection Day is what all of that was about. Jesus told his disciples that he would rise from the dead, and then he did. But he left them and us with a sacred assignment. An assignment that only few could ever understand. Only just the few could ever embrace. He told us in the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, out of the Message Bible, he said this. He said, go out, he said, and tell everyone you meet. He said, tell everyone you meet, far and near, in this way of life. Tell everyone you meet about this. You see, in relationships that we have, we either do one of a couple of things. We either become someone that helps someone to do what they're doing, or we become someone that takes them to a better place in life. I had to choose in my life what, whether or not that I was going to take someone to a better place, or whether I was going to actually leave them where they were, or join them in their own disappointments. But Jesus said, take this way of life, marking them in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He said, but, he said, then instruct them. Everyone say instruct. instruct. How many of you could actually agree with me for just a moment? For just a moment. That you could actually admit that there was so much, so much, disagreement in life that we didn't really know what to do. 
If you could believe this for just a moment, you may not realize how challenging it is to stand in front of people attempting not to touch anyone's opinions about something. And with thousands of people around life, believe me when I tell you, it becomes more challenging all the time. And you have to become less and less potent about anything that you say. You can say nothing with great conviction, but Jesus gave us an instruction. He said, instruct them in this way of life. And he said, in the practice of all I've commanded you. He said, I'll be with you as you do this, day after day. He said, right up unto the end of the age. Every man, dearest, every man has his own way of dealing with being estranged from God. You know, isn't it about when we have our, our children that all of a sudden what happens is, is that they begin to negotiate exactly the way that they think that things should go. So what it is, is that they're willing, you're telling them, say, now look. It's like the young man who, who actually, at a, at a dinner table, one time told, told his, um, his parents, you know, uh, about, you know, some of the things that were going on. And his father turned around and said to him, he said, now, didn't I, didn't you and I decide together that you were no longer uh, going to be talking to this individual. He said, oh yes, Dad. He said, I, we've agreed. I've, I, we, we agreed. I, I don't talk to that individual. We just text. <laughs> and that's exactly what people do. They're just kind of like, they're not really talking with it, but they're texting with it. And in life, that's what happens with people. But religions in this life are very exclusive. Take a look and see the different religions. Orthodox Jews claim to have the true path. Muslims claim to have the best revelation of God. Hindus believe that they are right. And Buddhists believe that one must achieve enlightenment by looking within and not without. But modern pluralists, and this is what you and I are facing right now in the world in which we live. Everyone say pluralism. pluralism. Say it again. Pluralism. Now even if you don't ever say that word another time in your entire life, let me explain to you what pluralism really means. Plural, pluralism is an interesting term because pluralism just gives the idea that every man has his own right to make his own decisions, and thus there is not anything that is right, and there's not anything that is wrong. But in truth, all paths do not lead to the same God. The different religions even describe different gods. All religions agree that mankind is in a mess. Not any of them think that we're really kind of hitting on all eight cylinders. They agree that mankind is a mess. Each religion sets out its own way of rescuing us from the desperate situation that we're in. Listen to what Muhammad has to say. He says, if you will only keep the five rules of Islam, then you'll be able to escape from this deep well that you've found yourself in. You must pray five times a day. Eat no pork, that takes out all the rib joints you go to. <laughs> Eat no pork, drink no alcohol, keep the feast of Ramadan, and make the pilgrimage to Mecca. Buddha says, I can see that you're in a mess. I can see it. The problem is due to pain and desire. If you follow the noble eightfold path, you will escape from these ultimately and you will enter into nirvana. The man may find inner peace, but he still finds himself on the deep well of life. But Jesus comes to the top of the proverbial well and he looks down and says, 
I can see that you're in a mess. I can see it. I can see that things are difficult for you. You'll never get out by your own resources. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have to let down a rope. And I'm going to come down into the well myself in order to be able to rescue you. I will hold you firmly because you don't even have the strength to hold on yourself. You see, while we all affirm the right for people to believe as they decide, we do. Because they do anyway. So it doesn't matter if you agree. Because people believe what they want to believe. They embrace what they want to embrace. They choose what they want to choose. But I put it here so I could be nice about it. While we all affirm the right for people to believe as they decide, this doesn't mean that we believe that all faiths are truth. You see, each and every religion, friends, that there are in the world, and it doesn't matter which one that you go to or which one you embrace, each and every one of them have an end until you come to Jesus. The most hated figure in all of recorded time. Because you see, Jesus has no end. His ability does not come to a close to be able to help and to be able to save and to be able to deliver. He is the one that you and I have chosen to serve. He came down into that well of life with us. And what he did was, was he said, I'll be here with you. And when you're ready, I'll take you out. When you're ready, I'll deliver you. When you're ready, I'll set you free. You see, all men need a Savior. In the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse number 12, the Bible tells us this. He says, wherefore... He said, as by one man, he said, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. In the book of Romans chapter 3, verse number 10, we already understand this in life. He says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Why would that be so? Simply because of this, is that I can, I can say this, you and I, Living inside of the confines of the United States of America, the greatest nation that the world has ever seen, and even at its greatest moments, there was still something lacking. But I can tell you this, that the rest of the world does not grade on a curve. Life in its truth, in its, in its realities, actually is very stark. It's very raw. Truth comes to the foreground. Falsities lie behind. When what we have done is that we've set up a set of rules, we then can begin to try to have a society with one another. But yet at the same time, even though that that is true, still it leaves something to be desired. And in the truth of all things, there's none righteous. There isn't any one of us in here that have never, ever made a mistake. There's not any one of us inside this room, nor anyone that we know that has actually lived a life that we, even ourselves, believe would be absolutely perfect. But you may say, but that really doesn't matter. What really matters is that you're good enough. You did a good enough job. That's because what we did was we set up our own requirements for what, what we thought, what we thought was good enough in order to bring a person into the gates of heaven. We never thought about what was God's requirements to be able to justify and lift up a man out of that well that he had found himself in and bring him home to be with him forever. 
then also we understand, we know there's none righteous. We also understand that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know that the wages of those things, what we call sin. And let me explain sin to you because immediately when you begin to say the word, there's a shut off with people. But let me explain sin to you. Let's just say it from the word sincerity. You can be sincere about life, can't you? But you can also be sincerely wrong. Have you ever known someone that was sincerely wrong about life? But they were sincere. But they were sincerely wrong about what they believed. The same thing is true. I mean, it really doesn't matter if the gas gauge in my car tells me that I have three quarters of a tank filled with gas, but yet all of a sudden my car is on the side of the road and it's sputtering and it stops. The first thing I think, even though the gauge told me that I was three quarters of a tank full, what is the first thing that you look for? Are you out of gas? Because life can tell you whatever it wants to tell you. And you have to choose whether or not that you are going to believe what God said about himself. Not what people said about God, but what God said about himself. I will choose that this day. I've never found life to be able to deliver anyone that still wanted their own ways. But the moment that a person would say to God, God, I want your ways in my life, and I don't want mine, is the moment that the prison doors open and an individual is able to walk out absolutely free. Absolutely free. We know those wages. The wages of actual sincerity, but being sincerely wrong, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. But what did God say about Jesus Christ? That's the part that I think is really interesting, that since Jesus is the answer, and really it's not Mohammed, it's not Buddha, it's not Krishna, it's not the Shintus or the Thais, it's not any of these individuals. Jesus is the only one that came back to make sure that what he preached came to pass in my life and in yours. In the book of John chapter 10, verse number 11, the Bible tells us this. He said, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. John 11, verse number 25, Jesus speaking to Martha, and he said this. He said, I'm the resurrection, and I am the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. You heard Peter say this in our video today. Peter said this in John chapter 14, verse number 6. He said, I am the way. Not some other way. Not all ways lead to the same place. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, no man comes to the Father except through this path. No other path. In Acts chapter 4, verse number 12, the Bible tells us this. It says, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby you and I must be saved. But he came to redeem mankind. He came to buy us back from the marketplace of slavery. How does this work? In the book of Luke, chapter 19, verse number 10, he says, for the Son of Man is is come to seek and save that which was lost. Redemption, friends. Him buying us back. Him raising from the dead. Him opening that tomb. Was opening that tomb, think of it from your perspective for just a moment. What was the reason why Jesus came out of the tomb when it comes to you? For many, they don't know why. But Jesus came to redeem you from this present age according to God's will for you, for your family, 
for your kids. Life's in a mess. But Jesus cleans up really well. So redemption involves recovering something. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 20, the Bible tells us this. He says, for you're bought with a price. He said, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. He said, which, friends, are God's. Isaiah chapter 43, verse number 25, he said, I, even I, am he that blots out your transgressions. He's blotted out your transgressions. Say, he has blotted out out my transgressions. transgressions. He holds nothing against you. He's blotted out your transgressions. He said, for my own sake, he said, I will not remember your sin. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 7, probably the greatest church that the Bible has ever uttered when it spoke, said this. It says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. That we have redemption through his blood. He has paid the price for you. Just for you. We speak so much about the love of God. But what did he come to get? He came to get your love back. Because it's a covenant that he's making with you. God desires to make a covenant with you. He wants to marry you. Let me give you just three benefits that we receive in redemption. These are your benefits. This is his heart for you. Number one, you'll never be stranded again. In the book of John chapter 1 verse number 12, the Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God even to those who believe in his name. Number two, you are no longer guilty. No more guilt. No more shame. No more low self-esteem. No more telling yourself that you are no good. He called you good. Don't allow those voices to have you drag your life through hell in this life into a web that you can never be free from. Because it just multiplies. It just multiplies. In the book of Romans chapter 5 verse number 1, the apostle Paul writing the words of God to the church at Rome said this, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. Say God has offered me peace peace. with him. him. 
He's given you peace. He's given you peace. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 21, the Bible tells us this, For he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we would be made the righteousness of God in him. I like what the NIV had to say. It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Say, God, God has raised me up, raised me up and, put me and put me in a place of dignity, of dignity in, this life. in this life. Don't be dragged through this life's mud. You're much greater than you ever thought that you were. You are. God's son. You are. God's daughter. You are not the label that this world has placed upon you. You're not the words that other human beings have attempted to attach to you. You belong to the king himself. You're his property and only his words can have effect upon you. Not the words that come in your mind or the first thing that you think about in the morning. But his words. He is your father. His words mean everything to you. In Philippians chapter 3, verse number 9, in the God's Word translation of the Bible that tells us this. And to have a relationship with Him. This means that I didn't receive God's approval by obeying His laws. The opposite is true. I have God's approval through my faith in Christ. This is the approval that comes from God and is based on faith. Then lastly, number three, I wanted you to know this more than anything else, that you are no longer separated. You're not separated from him anymore. Don't ever believe that you're separated from him. He has drawn you to himself. to hold you and to care for you. To wipe away the tears that this life has caused you to shed. He made everything right for you. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse number 4, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, he has made us alive together with Christ, for by grace are you saved. And he has raised you up together with him, and he has made you sit together with him in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. He has raised you up. You. The one who never believed that they could ever be raised up in any part of life. You. The one who has chanted so many incantations and positive thoughts so that you could attempt to drown the voice of disappointment. He has raised you up together with him. He has made you to sit together with him in heavenly places. It's what he did for you. But now what do you do? Now how do I face this? Having known all of these things, 
in my life. Having internally faced off with the issues. Having attempted to have my good business practice has become the very thing that causes me to skate beyond that inner nudging that says, I want you. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he said, for God says at just the right time I heard you. On the day of salvation I helped you. He said, indeed, God is ready to help you right now. He's ready to help you right now. Today is the day of salvation. Jesus said these words. As he looked out upon the people, he saw them tired and wondering and wavering, not knowing what tomorrow may bring. And he said this. He said, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion and life? Come to me. He said, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting upon you. Keep company with me. And you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Resurrection Day. What was it for? Who is it for? It was for you. The invitation that was made to you. You may have thought that it was in honor of the resurrection. But it wasn't. The resurrection was in honor of you. And there's a question. Just one question. And that question is, what now? What about today? Where do I go? How do I act? What does all this mean? I remember in that mental institution that night. I thought that once again I was kind of getting my life regulated. Because you can regulate anywhere you want. Once, once you understand that you can live in any part of the city that you want, 
you know you can also adapt or adapt to any of the situations that life throws at you. You learn how to walk with a limp. You can handle the fact that you're blind in one eye and you can't see out of the other. You can do, you can go through all of that. You can deal with the fact that you have a horrible marriage. You can deal with the fact that you feel like life just really stinks. You can deal with all of the facts. You can deal with the fact that you have no money. You can deal with the fact that your kids are on drugs. You can deal with the fact that you're absolutely miserable about life. You can deal with all of those facts. You can deal with it and you can regulate to it. But that night for me was different. Because someone was coming to me that I was unsure that I was ever going to see again. All my life, I wanted to see him. All my life, I refused to give in to the idea that he did not exist my life and I knew that this was the chance that I had because it was just at that moment when I wasn't trying to live my life behind a shell where I could see everything was going on but I couldn't touch it for this moment in my life. The deepest part of me was now open. And it was that part that if he offered me a new life if he offered me that I could please him. I knew what I deserved. What I deserved was no question. And the hardest thing that you'll ever do in your life is the moment when you let somebody love you. It's the hardest thing you will ever face. You can love people and you can be selfless. But the moment that you become helpless and hopeless, and you know that someone is coming to your life that is taking nothing but covering you and protecting you. <coughs> someone you don't have to be. Someone who that you're not with. Someone who knows everything about you. And they cover you just the same. That was the one who came to me that night. It was a question that I could not escape. For I knew that if I turned him away, that the mental institution that I was already occupying could only give way to one thing. <coughs> and that was self-demise. Because truly, there's no reason to live. If all that there is to life is to try to make money grow up, get old, Give all the money back to the people that you got it from the first time. Because you're going to give it back when you're in the rest home. If that's all that there was to life, live fast, 
die young and make a good looking corpse. So this morning I want to ask a question. But I'm even asking the question of some of you that thought you already had it. Because sometimes, even with ice cream, you got to go back for a second scoop. A spiritual life is exactly the same thing. It gives you a deeper understanding. Because you just might, it, might have rode the wrong horse into town. But he's calling you now. So let's bow our heads for a moment and let's pray. Let's ask God. If you're here this morning and you know that you've never received Christ, and I'm not talking about that when you were in children's church that you prayed a prayer and you went up front and everyone took a picture of you and say, look, he just got saved. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you know, you know whether or not you are. You know. Because he wants you. So if you know that you haven't received Jesus, I'm going to ask you in a moment to just raise your hand. I don't want you to come forward. I'm not going to make a big deal of you. I just want to help you. I want to help you. Begin the journey that you need. Because your future is awaiting your journey. It's your journey. Oh, I've got time. You ran out of time the moment you were born. Or you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I know that that's me. I've been away from the Lord, but I don't want to be away from Him anymore. This is my resurrection day. I surrender today. So if you're either one of those two people, you've never received the Lord in your life, Nobody's trying to get you in their club. Or you've never truly surrendered. And you know you must surrender now. On the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. All over this room, I already know how many that there are of you. I already know. This is your moment. On the count of three, ready? One, two, three. All over the room, please keep your hands raised. That's true. I already know who you are. Just raise your hands and keep them raised me if you have been away from God or if you know that now is your time you can put your hands down thank you
And I know that there are several of you that didn't raise your hand and you wouldn't. But you know that today is your day. Because today is the day of salvation. If that's true about you, please raise your hand and let me pray with you. Someone else. Thank you. Someone else. Let us all pray this prayer together. <clears throat> Say, My Father and my God, I humble myself before you. I belong to you. I am your property. Today is the day of my surrender to you. Receive me, my King, into your presence and into your life. Holy Spirit, speak to me. Speak in me your new life. I will humble myself as I declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Can we give Jesus a big hand clap? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord Jesus.